But I thanked everybody for coming and the guest keys again. And uh, we talked about the, the gravity and the dark and matter and dark energy. Now, this is what Bob will be talking about. But if he if he if he decides not to and he starts talking about gardening or you know home improvement, I told him that we're a really sophisticated audience and we wouldn't let him get away with that in the question period. So. After, uh, after Bob's talk, there will be questions, and also there'll be, uh, Bob will be signing books at the back. I'd say in the back of the room, but it's actually a little boat back there that he'll be signing books at, and you want to see the boat if, for no other reason than it's a really cool thing. Now, this is the um, time in the introduction when I'm supposed to give the bi a little bit of a biography of Bob, but you know I'm not gonna do that uh, tonight. I, 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 I will say, briefly that he grew up in the Boston area and he attended college at that, uh, that uh, small com uh, commuter school at somewhere north around Boston that starts with an H. And after his uh, time there, he went out to the West Coast and got his PhD in astronomy at another obscure uh, place called Caltech. Um, but enough about Bob, I wanted to talk a little bit about myself. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Well, actually, I'm not entirely kidding. But I, I do want to talk about is a little bit of my, my experience uh, being uh, in an audience that, uh, where Bob was speaking. I first met him um, a year and a half ago at a Renaissance weekend in Santa Monica. And Bob was um, one of the key speakers uh, at the conference. And, you know, I'm a corporate lawyer. I know nothing about any of this stuff. Um, I know pretty much nothing about corporate law either, but that's a different story. <laughs> uh, but I was enthralled by uh, Bob's talk about uh, the expanding and accelerating universe. I think like all of us, we've looked out in the, in the night sky and seen all of these stars and the Milky Way and get a little bit of a sense of that was uh, pretty impressive to me. Um, my first thought was uh, to uh, see if Bob would be willing to adopt me. <laughs> and then, then I thought that sounded kind of weird, uh, because mainly I'm older than he is. And then I realized it was probably really weird because he probably gets people asking him to adopt them all the time. So I decided that, that was not uh, uh, something to do. And then I thought, well, maybe because I was on the board of the Athenaeum and connected with this wonderful lecture series, I'd invite him to speak. And that's what I did. And I was very, very pleased that he accepted a year and a half ago. I've been looking forward to this night for a long time, and I hope you'll all join me in welcoming Bob Kirk. Thank you for this talk on corporate law, which I'll be doing. <laughs> so uh, what I want to do tonight, if I possibly can, is to tell you the 13.7 billion year history of the universe in 40 minutes. And to do that, I have to leave out a lot of details. I have to leave out things that are traditional to be included in history, things like kings or wars or earth. Uh, and uh, I also have to leave out uh, references to most of my um, colleagues because I found that that's a way to really compress the talk, is not to give credit to anyone else. <laughs> So I'm going to talk about the expanding universe, and I'm going to talk about the fact that the universe is accelerating. And I'll explain what that means. This picture gives you some idea of what the subject is. I'm going to be talking about galaxies. So you see that big, beautiful spiral galaxy, which is made up of about 100 billion stars. And then there's some dust there that uh, no one has cleaned up that uh, is absorbing some of the light. And then down in the lower left, there's a single star, which is a supernova, a star that is exploding, and for a little while, about a month, glowing as brightly as four billion stars like the sun. And it turns out that those supernovae are very useful tools for judging the distances to galaxies and for measuring the history of cosmic expansion. And it's by looking at supernovae, near and far, that we've been able to trace out the history of cosmic expansion and to see that the universe was expanding, uh, uh, that the universe was decelerating, slowing down at first, 
and then that this changed into an acceleration about five billion years ago, about the time the Earth was formed, and that since that time the universe has been expanding faster and faster. This is an extraordinary idea, uh, and it involves these beautiful objects, the galaxies and the supernovae, and so I'll be trying to put these beautiful ideas and these beautiful images together for you tonight. But I thought, since I came, you know, here it's Nantucket, and this is the place where the Mariah Mitchell Observatory is, and Mariah Mitchell, in the middle of the 1800s, was a person who used astronomical instruments to great effect. She found a comet in, in uh, 1847 from the roof of the Pacific Bank building from which, at which her father was the cashier. I guess that let you get in late at night. I don't know. Anyway, uh, and I thought I'd just say a word about the development of technology and a little bit about women in science that are related to Mariah Mitchell because, after all, we're here. So it turns out comets were a big topic in astronomy in the 1800s. In 1842, there was a dramatic comet that everyone could see that was a brilliant thing and that was seen in Boston. And the people of Boston came to the little college in Cambridge and said, where's the telescope? How could we see this comet? And it turned out that Harvard did not have a research telescope. And that was 1842. By 1843, they had built the world's largest telescope, shown here. Uh, and there's a plaque of the donors on the wall over there, which includes John Quincy Adams and other uh, uh, Harvard and uh, Boston notables. Anyway, they uh, raised enough money in six months to build the world's largest telescope. I'll come to the end when I'll talk about building the world's largest telescope now. And if any of you want to be on the plaque that goes up there, see me afterwards. Okay. <laughs> now, the interesting thing is that the development of astronomy is in a lot of ways the development of technology. The ability to collect light and measure light is an important thing. So here I show you the first uh, image which was recorded on photographic, uh, 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 by photographic technique. This is a daguerreotype of the moon, which was taken at Harvard in 1852. And that was the first time that people had used a telescope. Instead of uh, putting the light into your eye, as Mariah Mitchell did in 1847, when she found her comet on October 1st. See, I read the website. Uh, the, uh, 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 the way to do this uh, very soon after was to photograph the sky. And of course, a photograph is something that can be examined later, that provides a permanent record, and also it can be a time exposure where you leave the shutter open uh, for a long period of time. And so these first emulsions were very slow, these uh, daguerreotypes are very slow. It took a lot of light to make an image. Uh, and something that's also connected with Mariah Mitchell is that she was one of the first, as far as I know, professional astronomer who was a woman. And uh, when she went to Vassar, she became a kind of influential person and set a number of people on the path to becoming astronomer, including some of these women, I think, who were uh, called the computers. That was the name for you, the job of computing, uh, at Harvard anyway. Uh, they were called the computers. And uh, these women, shown here in this kind of stagey photograph, uh, were um, important in advancing science, especially at Harvard, especially in the late years of the 19th century and into the 20th century. And they're shown here uh, in this rather cramped room, everybody wearing these long silk dresses and so on, working. <laughs> the origin of that was that the um, observatory director had a man as his an assistant as his assistant, and uh, who was kind of an incompetent guy. And one day he got mad at him. And he said, you know, he said, my housekeeper could do a better job than you. And uh, then he thought, I'll hire my housekeeper. And so he did. His housekeeper became the head of these women who worked as uh, astronomers at Harvard. And so was it exploitation? Sure, they were being paid. 25 cents an hour, but the observatory director was only being paid $2 an hour, so, you know, figure it out. And, uh, but they had the opportunity, and they had the opportunity to really do scientific work and to publish work under their own names. 
One of the most famous of them is Henrietta Swan Leavitt, who discovered there was a certain kind of star uh, which was identifiable by its variations. It got brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer, but if you measured the length of time, the period that it took to get bright and dim, you could tell how bright it really was, whether it was an extraordinarily bright star or a dim one, by measuring something that didn't depend on the distance. And she said, kind of diffidently, you know, it's worthy of notice that the brighter variables have the longer periods. And this became the key to opening up the size of the universe and the history of cosmic expansion that I'm going to explain tonight. Harla Shapley, who was the observatory director and took a lot of the credit for Henrietta Leavitt's work, used Leavitt's variable stars to measure the Milky Way, the system that the Sun is in, to see how big it was. If you knew how bright the star was from its variability, then you could figure out how far away it was from its apparent brightness. And he was able to show that the Milky Way is really big compared to the solar system and that we, despite our sense of importance, are not at the center of the Milky Way. So here I show you a picture. This is not the Milky Way, <laughs> but it shows that you are not at the center of, I mean, not you, but Nantucket is not at the center of the universe. The Earth is around the Sun. The Sun is a citizen of the Milky Way galaxy, 100 billion stars, and we're not anywhere near the center. We're somewhere out in the edge. Now, what Shapley was able to do with those stars that Henrietta Leavitt had measured was to see how big the Milky Way was. So you know that the speed of light is a poet's metaphor for really fast. And, uh, but what is the speed of light? The speed of light is a foot, a foot, that's a unit of distance that's used here and in Myanmar, uh, a foot in a nanosecond, in a billionth of a second, so light travels from here to there. And so when you see the world, you don't see the world as it is, you see the world as it was when the light bounced off the things that you're seeing. So I'm looking at the people in the front here, they are 10 nanoseconds away. And curiously, don't be insulted, the people in the back seem younger. <laughs> because I see them as they were 100 nanoseconds ago. OK, just a humorous remark in this room. But in astronomy and in the scale of the universe, it's not just a joke. It means that we get to see what the universe was like in the past by looking at distant objects. So the time it takes light to travel across the Milky Way is about 100,000 years. Uh, and uh, Shapley thought that that was big enough that it constituted uh, the universe. But that's not, that's not quite true, it t as I'll show you in a second. Uh, so here's the Milky Way. This is an image. Last night, we had the chance to go out and see the Milky Way. Nice and dark here in Nantucket, I must say. People have been shooting out the streetlights with 22s or something. I don't know. Anyway, very good. Congratulations. Because uh, uh, you can see the Milky Way. This is a composite showing photographs from the northern hemisphere, where we are, and from the southern hemisphere. No one ever sees the whole Milky Way uh, like this, because the Earth gets in the way, but never mind that. And here's a picture of the Milky Way. In 1917, and I'll show you why that's an important date, that's when Einstein started to work on this problem, people thought that the Milky Way was the universe, that the stars in the Milky Way, that they were the things that constituted the universe. And if you look at this picture, well, it looks like that's the most important thing in the picture. But over here, is a little thing, one of the nebulae, the little fuzzy things, uh, which I'll show you in a minute, is equivalent to the Milky Way and that this change in the picture from our galaxy being the universe to our galaxy being just one citizen in a universe that's much larger took place after 1917. Okay. So uh, I alluded already to Einstein. A speaker is always wise to ally himself with really good people. <laughs> Albert 
Einstein, really good. Okay, so here he is. And this is a photograph, and again, I wanted to emphasize the technology. If you look at this, you see a nice picture of Einstein, but you see the guy behind him, sorry, shaking his head, no. And the person who was sitting in the chair next to him in the foreground got up and left during the time the shutter was open. There are two things here. One is nobody wants to be between the camera and Einstein. The other is that uh, the shutter was open a long time because this was a photograph taken with the process of chemistry on silver that was the way everybody, including astronomers, detected light back then, and I'll come back to that. Okay, Not a, now the new thing is that we're able to see what people were thinking in those days. And here what you can see is that Einstein was thinking the universe, by which people meant the Milky Way, must be static. That means not expanding or contracting. And in fact, it's true that the stars of the Milky Way are not systematically moving apart or moving together, and astronomers had told Einstein that. So he thought, well, all right, if the Milky Way is the universe and the stars are not expanding or contracting, and I have invented general relativity, oh, I forgot that part, if I have in invented general relativity, which is the theory of gravity, I have to think of a way to make a universe that is static and obeys these new rules of gravity, which I've just invented, which he did. And he did it by putting in an extra term. He kind of cheated. He put in a term which was allowed by the theory but not required by it, which he called the cosmological term. And he put it in, as he said, to arrive at this conclusion, we admittedly had to introduce an extent. Can you read this from the back? Because it's in German. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> We admittedly had to introduce an extension of the field equations which is not justified by our actual knowledge of gravitation. It's to be emphasized, however, blah, blah, blah. This term is necessary only for the purpose of making possible a quasi-static static, distribution of matter as required by the fact of the small velocities of the stars. So in other words, Einstein stuck in by hand afterwards this cosmological constant, usually denoted by the Greek letter lambda, to make the universe static, to agree with the astronomical observations of the day. The thing that changed was the astronomical observations. You know, in this field, we're always confident, but rarely correct. <laughs> and how did that happen? It happened by technology. It happened by the invention or the construction of uh, bigger and better telescopes. So this is the great telescope of the day, uh, just after World War I. This is the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson. It's built with the technology that might characterize the Titanic. But unlike the Titanic, it kept its distance from icebergs. And it's up there on Mount Wilson to this day. The thing that has changed, of course, is that the little village of Los Angeles, which had 25,000 people, uh, when this was built, has, is now emitting a lot of light and making this not such a great astronomical sight. Anyway, here it is, the 100-inch telescope, the mirror. It's down here, 100 inches across, a little over 8 feet. And the observer would sit up on this bentwood chair and uh, control the telescope uh, through the night. And even though it's California, it's a mountaintop and it's not warm. Uh, so uh, here is... Oh, sorry. So I was supposed to show you the most important thing is the place where the observer would sit. Just like the most important thing in that other picture uh, was the, not the big object, um, but the thing off to the side. And so here's a picture of Edwin Hubble, who was an astronomer working at the Mount Wilson Observatories, who showed that the Milky Way was not the whole universe, that the universe was a much bigger place, and that we live in a universe of galaxies, each of which is equivalent to the one that we live in. So instead of thinking that we lived in the universe, we live in a part of the universe that is the Milky Way galaxy. And the way he did that was by using these photographic plates. Here's one taken in 1923, where you can see there's some markings on it. Don't worry, the markings are on the back side, which is the glass side of the plate. And he wrote uh, the date, 6th of November, 
And then there's that star up at the top right where he thought it was N, a nova, a new star that had appeared. And then he said, no, it's a variable star. And it turned out it was one of those variable stars that Henrietta Leavitt had talked about. Henrietta Leavitt had told you that the relation between the um, period of the variation and the luminosity was what it, she told her what, him what that was. And he used that to figure out how far away this blob of uh, fuzziness must be. And this is all reported in a book, a very fine book, which you know you may wish to stock because there's a new edition from Yale, the fourth edition, for which I wrote the foreword, uh, which is, uh, uh, explains the discoveries that he made back in the 1920s. And the idea is that those stars whose bright, intrinsic brightness he knew were much dimmer than any of the stars like that in the Milky Way. And by that means, he was able to infer the distance to these galaxies. Now, how far away are they? Well, I told you that light travels a foot in a nanosecond. And so you could uh, just as easily, instead of using a, a, a ruler that tells you distance in feet, you could use a stopwatch that tells you time in nanoseconds. And that would be good for, you know, remodeling or construction or something like that. Well, OK, silly on Earth. But if you want to measure the distance to, to galaxies or to stars, it's a good unit. The time that light, the distance that light travels in a year, we call a light year. And it turns out that the stars that you can go out after this lecture and see, some of them are 10 or 100 or even 1,000 light years away. So the light that you're seeing left them, for example, when the Federalists controlled both houses of Congress. Uh, the light from the Andromeda galaxy, this fuzzy thing that Hubble was studying, left about one and a half million years ago. So the scale of things expanded very greatly. The scale of the Milky Way turns out to be about 100,000 years. The scale of the distances between galaxies is on the order of millions of light years, 10 times as big. So if you think of a dinner plate, maybe a foot across, and a dinner table, 10 feet long, the galaxies are like plates being passed around at the Thanksgiving dinner. OK, sometimes they collide, but most of the time they spin far apart. And the galaxies are uh, separated by large distances from one another. Now, if Hubble had just done that, we would know that we lived in a big universe in which the Milky Way was not the most important thing. But it turns out there's something else that's very important. The universe is in motion. And this was discovered by the guy with the curious name of Vesto Melvin Slipher, who worked at the Lowell Observatory. Percival Lowell the, of the Harvard and Boston Lowells um, was fascinated with the planet Mars. And he thought there was life on Mars. And so he built an observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, to study life on Mars. But they did some useful things, too. And uh, it turns out that Slipher looked at these fuzzy things, like the one I pointed out near the Milky Way, uh, and showed or looked to see what the light from them was composed of. The idea is you take the light from an object, capture it with a telescope, and then spread it out into a spectrum, into a rainbow, uh, with the instrument that he's got there. And it turns out you can, as I'll explain in a second, you can measure the velocity. You can measure whether something's coming toward you or away from you by looking at its spectrum. And he found something quite extraordinary, very parallel to what Hubble had found. Hubble found that the nebulae were very, more, were very much more distant than the objects in the Milky Way. Slipher found that the velocities were a lot bigger than for stars in the Milky Way, that they were moving at hundreds or thousands of kilometers a second, where the typical velocity for uh, stars in the Milky Way was 1 or 10 or a few hundred. What's more, uh, almost all of them were moving away from us. So let me explain that for a second. You know that uh, stars are made of atoms. We're made of atoms. The world's made of atoms. Uh, and uh, stars, like the sun, are made of the same atoms on Earth. And they b obey the same physical laws. So that means 
that the atoms are behaving the same in these assemblies of stars or assemblies of stars like galaxies. This was meant to be a haiku, stars made of atoms, the same atoms on Earth, galaxies of stars. Well, just an affectation, I suppose. But here is a, a rainbow, and uh, as an astronomer like Slipher might have measured it, on his photographic plates. And you can see that it's broken by these lines, these particular wavelengths or colors that are absent where light is being absorbed. Now, you know what a scientist's job is. It's to take something beautiful, like a rainbow, and to turn it into a graph. And so we've done that up here. And what you can see is these dips at the places where the light is missing. And it turns out that those dips correspond exactly, or almost exactly, to the places where light is absorbed by atoms on the Earth. If you have a tube full of sodium gas, it turns out that you've seen sodium lamps, perhaps. Then they glow in that funny yellow color. And there's a particular wavelength where they emit and a particular wavelength where those atoms absorb light. And that's a very well-defined thing in the spectrum of a star or a galaxy. What Slipher found was that the wavelengths at which he measured them, the color at which they appeared, were not the same as the wavelengths at which they appeared on the Earth or in a laboratory. They were shifted a little bit to the red. They were stretched out to longer wavelengths. Now, uh, you're used to this uh, effect for uh, sound, the Doppler effect. You know when cars are coming toward you or cars are going away from you. You know that from the way they sound. They go past you. They go, vroom, vroom. and it's a higher pitch when they're coming toward you, and it's a lower pitch when, they go past, when they're going away from you. And there's that moment when you, you hear that happening, and you know from the sound whether things are coming toward you or away from you. It turns out there's a similar effect for light, but the speed of light is a million times bigger than the speed of sound. So for ordinary speeds, like cars going by on the highway, you don't see the headlights looking blue and the taillights look, well, you do actually see the taillights looking red. That is for another reason. It has to do with how the taillights are manufactured. Okay, so there is a way to tell whether things are coming toward you or away from you. And so uh, Hubble had measured distances and Slipher had measured velocities. So you know what a scientist will do when they have two lists of numbers? You'll put them together on a plot. And here's the plot. Velocity up this way, where the definition is bigger than zero means away from you. Okay, there are a few approaching us, including the Andromeda galaxy, the one that Hubble's measured the distance to that's so nearby. And as you go farther away, the distances are bigger, or uh, yes, of course, the distances are bigger as you go farther away. The velocities are bigger as you go farther away. Things are moving away from us. The nearby things are moving away from us slowly. The distant things are moving away from us more rapidly. We've known this since 1929. The picture that we have in our minds is that the universe uh, is uh, exp expanding. One thing that's kind of curious is that, Einstein, uh, that uh, Hubble measured, made these measurements in 1925 of the distances, and Slipher measurements had been public since then. It took from 1925 to 1929 for Hubble to get around to making that plot and connecting Slipher's redshifts with his own distances. And in this book, did I mention that I wrote the foreword for it? Yes. Uh, he says, uh, he explains why. He said, well, he said, there was a natural inertia in the face of revolutionary ideas couched in the unfamiliar language of general relativity, that is, Einstein's theory of gravity. Discourage, he says in the passive voice, immediate investigation. In other words, I just didn't do it, you know? <laughs> OK, now at Harvard, uh, most of the students and all of the tenured faculty believe that the Hubble law is the perfectly natural thing because they personally are at the center of everything. And so I've shown here what I call the egocentric universe in which you personally are at the center and the galaxies somehow know that and are all moving away from you. I gotta say, this is not the picture that we use in the astronomical world. 
we had the idea, the more democratic idea, that comes from our, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it humiliation, but our education over time, that we're really not at the center of the universe. So for example, is the Earth at the center of the solar system? Well, you know, Copernicus had an opinion on that, and people have more or less over time, thank you, in case I need those, uh, has more or less over time come to accept that, you know, the Earth is not at the center of the solar system. And I showed you that slide a while ago that showed Nantucket and the rest of the Earth are not at the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And it would be a kind of, um, I don't know, sort of deliberately misunderstanding the facts to think that the Milky Way must yet somehow be the absolute center of things. What we think instead is maybe our view is the same as the view that anybody else would have. And I'll try to convince you of that by the cheap trick of animation. So I'm going to show you this cheap trick animation in which all I've done is expand the picture from one frame to another. It didn't do anything else. And what you can see is that when things are lined up on this galaxy, that the galaxies that were formerly nearby move a small distance. The galaxies that were farther away move a big distance in the same length of time. In other words, the nearby galaxies are moving away slowly, the more distant ones moving away more rapidly, the same as Hubble's law. So the idea is that expansion is what Hubble's law is telling us, that the universe is expanding uniformly in all directions. Now, suppose I had the power through the, uh, I guess I'd get to have to get the permission of the historical commissioner. This doesn't seem like a historic building, but anyway. <laughs> So I have to get, I'm sure I would have to get a lot of permissions here in Nantucket to make this building bigger. Anyway, suppose I could double this building in size. What would you see? You'd see your neighbor, who's one seat away, move to two seats away. But the people who are 20 seats away, 10 seats away, keep it simple, people who are 10 seats away would end up 20 seats away in the same length of time. In other words, if I could make this place expand, you would see your neighbors moving away slowly and the distant people moving away rapidly. That's what that was supposed to show. But, you know, think of it from your own point of view. Okay, that's the best I can do. You'll notice whenever I wave my hands a lot, this is a difficult theoretical point. All right. Well, what about Einstein? Here's Einstein. He's visiting the Mount Wilson Observatory. It's 1931. Hubble had shown that the universe was expanding. You may recall, I started out by talking about Einstein, general relativity, and putting in the cosmological constant to make a static universe. But it's not a static universe, it's an expanding universe. So here's Hubble, uh, Einstein. Let me introduce the people here. Here's Hubble, the tall guy. He's being patted on the head by George Ellery Hale, the man who built the 100-inch the 200, the telescope and the 200-inch telescope. Here's Hummison, who really did the hard work. Uh, here's the proud guy. Here's uh, Michelson, who won the Nobel Prize. Here's Einstein, who won the Nobel Prize. I'll come back to that. Uh, here's uh, Campbell. Well, anyway, here's the director of the observatory. They're all very proud of this. Einstein came around and he said, OK, if the universe is expanding, then let's get rid of that cosmological constant. And here he is saying that. Let's get rid of lambda, he says. And he had de Sitter, the Dutch astronomer in Leiden, who had helped him understand that the, that the Milky Way was static, uh, got rid of the cosmological constant in 1931. And they said, well, think of a universe that's always expanding, but slowing down due to the effect of gravity. And the astronomer's job will be to measure how much it's slowing down. OK. So if you go to Washington and you go on the north side of the mall, uh, near the National Academy of Sciences, there's a wonderful statue of Einstein. So here he is. You know it's Einstein because he has no socks. Okay? And here he's got some equations on this bronze tablet, which he brought down from a mountain. It says on it, E equals mc squared. That's the only equation that's in Bartlett's book of familiar equations. Uh, here's the equation for the uh, photoelectric effect. You know, when light comes into a metal, it can kick out an electron. I'll be talking about that in a minute. They gave him the Nobel Prize for that, but they said, that doesn't mean we won't give it to you for something else. Uh, but they never did. 
uh, for general relativity. And this is the equation of general relativity, the basic equation that tells how the presence of matter curves space and objects move through that curved space. Well, anyway, it has no lambda. We'll come back to that, too. <laughs> okay. So Einstein had to kind of confess that introducing this cosmological constant was an error. And this has grown into a kind of legend. Uh, the person who created that legend was George Gamow, who was a popularizer of astronomy and physics and mathematics, as well as uh, one of the active people in the application of quantum mechanics to nuclear physics, and an immigrant to the United States. I read this book. Uh, well, I read many of his books when I was in high school, and I read this book later. This is his autobiography. Only he could have written it, as we say. Uh, it says, uh, Einstein's original gravity equation was correct, and changing it was a mistake. Much later, when I was discussing cosmological problems with Einstein. That's a phrase I wanted to put in my book, but you know, <laughs> no such luck. Much later, when I, he remarked that the introduction of the cosmological term was the biggest blunder he ever made in his life. But this blunder, rejected by Einstein, is still sometimes used by cosmologists even today, this is 1970, even today, and the cosmological constant denoted by the Greek letter lambda rears its ugly head again and again and again. <laughs> Very good, George. <laughs> Maybe a little too much. Anyway, uh, what I'm here tonight to tell you is we need this. We need something very much like the cosmological constant, something that pushes it back against gravity to explain the facts of today's observations of the universe. So let's get to those. Oh, not yet. Uh, did everybody buy into this, that throwing away the lambda, getting rid of the cosmological constant? Not quite. Uh, here's somebody in the shape of the Greek letter lambda blowing up the universe, as you can see. This is De Sitter. This is in Dutch, but you know, English is a dialect of Frisian. You can read Dutch. What is it that blows the ball up? What makes the universe expand or opswell, swell up? That's got to be na lambda. No other answer can be given. And then I have it down here in case I forget. Okay. And here's uh, Georges Lemaitre. Georges Lemaitre had an unusual combination of uh, initials after his name. He was a Jesuit, Belgian, and a PhD from MIT. He actually worked at Harvard, but Harvard did not yet give the PhD, and he needed that to get promoted at uh, Louvain. He says, everything happens as though the energy in the vacuum would be different from zero. He's trying to explain the cosmological constant. We associate a pressure P equals minus rho c squared to the energy, of, energy density of the vacuum. So rho, that's like mass, c squared, that's like Einstein's equation. It says that there's some pressure, there's something associated with empty space, it sounds like zen koan, there's empty space, has some properties, it has a negative pressure. This is essentially the meaning of the cosmical constant lambda. And what I'll show you is that that's the talk from the 1930s. Now we have data that show us that the universe is not decelerating, as you would get if there was only gravity, that it's accelerating, and the cause is something that might be very much like the cosmological constant. How do we do that? It's by having a different tool, a more powerful tool, than the one that Henrietta Leavitt had back in the 1920s and that Hubble exploited. It's these supernova, these exploding stars. So I show you here a galaxy, that's 100 billion stars, and an exploding star, one star, for a little while, shining as brightly as four billion stars like the sun. That's a million times brighter than the stars that Hubble used. A million times brighter. So the, bright, the apparent brightness goes to intrinsically. The apparent brightness goes down like the square of the distance. That means you can see it a thousand times as far away. Hubble saw those stars at millions of light years. That means we can see these stars, even if we use Hubble's equipment, at billions of light years. We can see far into the past and see what the universe was doing way back then 
when it was as young as the people in the back of the room. So you might think, great, we've got this problem solved, except, except the supernovae are very rare. There's about one per century in a galaxy. So if you assign a graduate student, you say, look, why don't you look at this galaxy and see when the supernova goes on? I'll get you a thesis out of that. And they say, well, I'm not going to do that. It's going to take a century. OK, I said, why don't you look at a lot of galaxies? <laughs> Hubble actually was onto this. He said, in the realm of the nebulae, which has a new forward in the fourth edition, <laughs> did I mention that? Supernovae can be detected at immense distances. And in principle, he said, they are a criterion of distance about as reliable as that of the total luminosities of, ga of the nebulae of the galaxies. Actually, it's better than that. Actually, however, uh, he was from Missouri, but uh, when he was the first, um, ro one of the first Rhodes Scholars, he went to Oxford and he came back with an English accent. And he wrote like this, actually, however, actually, however, the maxima are so seldom observed and the supernovae themselves are so rare that they contribute very little to the present problem. He was right about that. The problem is that they're rare, that they're only one in a hundred years in one galaxy. You have to look at lots of galaxies or look for a long time to do this. And that's where the technology comes in. <laughs> well, not yet. First, we had to understand the nature of the supernova. Here's Fritz Zwicky, a Swiss physicist who worked at Caltech. I knew him briefly when I was a graduate student before he died. He was a pioneer of a supernovae. He also realized that there must be much more matter out there associated with the galaxies than we see. There must be dark matter associated with them, which I'll allude to later. And he was a pioneer of rude gestures. Here he is <laughs> demonstrating what he called the spherical bastard. He said, my colleagues are bastards any way you look at them. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> OK, these supernovae, although they're rare, have happened in historic time. Tycho Brahe, Tycho, you. Uh, uh, well, here's some, uh, uh, a Danish astronomer uh, saw one in 1572 up in the constellation of uh, Cassiopeia, one of the constellations you might know. And here's a kind of uh, dramatic, well, actually, this is a picture taken with an iPhone, but uh, <laughs> this is a kind of a dramatic etching, you know, and here they are looking up, and they see the new star, and they can't believe it's true. That's a supernova, and if you look in that place today, this is what you see. It's the shreds of an expanding, of an exploded star. So all that stuff in the middle is shown, the green stuff is X-ray emission, shown as visible light for you, because uh, you don't have X-ray eyes, uh, that uh, is the hot stuff in the inside of this explosion, about 10 million uh, Kelvin degrees, that's emitting, that is mostly iron and the stuff that stars turn into as they <coughs> explode. That iron from the supernovae before the sun formed, of course, became the stuff that is the iron in the hemoglobin of your blood or in this car. If you ask yourself, where was this car manufactured? This is my wife's car, a 1951 Pontiac. You might think the answer is Detroit. The correct answer is supernovae five billion years ago. That's where the iron that's in that car, of which there is 3,200 pounds, uh, was created. So this is not something that's apart from you. This is, you have iron in your blood that came from supernova explosions before the formation of the sun. OK, so here's a diagram for supernovae of the same thing that I showed for Hubble, distance, now measured by how bright is the supernova, and velocity measured from the redshift, like Slipher did, only we did it. And what you can see is it's really good. There's a very nice relation between velocity and distance. The universe is expanding. I guess we knew that, but this is a very good tool for measuring it. It doesn't scatter much about the line. This little red square down here shows you where Hubble's measurements were, the ones that I showed you from 1929. So he had the elephant by the toenail back in 1929, and this takes you out. It turns out this distance corresponds to the light traveling to us for about 2 billion years. 
At the beginning, I said this is a 14 billion year lecture. And probably by now it's seeming like that. But uh, uh, the, uh, so two out of 14, this is only nearby, this is only the local universe. If you want to see what the universe was doing ba back in its early times, you have to look far away, you have to look at very faint objects, and you have to compare them to the nearby ones to see whether they were speeding up or slowing down. So let me tell you how to do that by speeding up. So here's a telescope in Chile that we used. This photograph, unlike the one of Einstein in that lecture room, is taken by starlight. And it's taken with a digital camera, like the kind that you have in your pocket right now, in which the light falls onto a piece of silicon or something like it. And by the photoelectric effect, for which Einstein received the Nobel Prize, uh, a electrical signal is generated that's proportional to the amount of light. These turn out to be 100 times more efficient than the detectors uh, that use uh, silver halide and chemistry. So the physical way of measuring light turns out to be uh, tremendously better, and we have benefited from that in the ability to look for distant supernovae. So, all right. So here's the idea. If the universe began in the Big Bang and was expanding, this is supposed to be scale of the universe with time. Expanding means getting bigger. And so that means going up on this plot. If it's slowing down as it gets bigger, then it will be curves downward. And we think that probably was true, that there was deceleration at the beginning. And what we're looking for is the signature of acceleration in the recent past. So here's the present. And we're looking back into the past of the universe. We want to find out what that history was, and the way we're going to do it is by comparing the measurements far in the past with the measurements not so far in the past, and to see whether the expansion has been going at a constant rate, speeding up, or slowing down. Now, a lot of people are interested in the future, okay? And there's some wacky ideas here about the future that I'll come back to at the end, and if I don't, you can ask a question. Whether the universe will expand forever or not. So here's the detectors. Let me just uh, dwell on this for a minute. Here's my thesis advisor, Bev Oak, and here he's holding the world's largest digital detector, 0.24 megapixels, cost a lot of money back in 1980-something. And there he is, and it's a smaller than his fingernail. Here's a modern detector. As you know, the fabrication of computer chips is one of the things that's really gotten better over time. Here's uh, someone just as happy as Bev Oak, although he's wearing a mask, you can still see he's happy, uh, John Tonry, and what he has here is a array of these silicon detectors, almost as big as the windshield of a car, well, okay, a mini, uh, anyway, that uh, is uh, an, a detector of light a hundred times better than a photographic plate. And with that, you can take a picture of the sky that includes many galaxies. So even though it's true that the supernovae are very rare, you have a chance to find the, uh, these rare events. Let's do the arithmetic. One in 100 years, that's about one in 5,000 weeks. OK. Maybe it's France or someplace, and they take a couple of weeks off. Anyway, uh, so if you look at 5,000 galaxies, your chances of finding a fresh supernova are quite good. The graduate students won't do that either. You know, you could say, watch this one for 100 years or watch 5,000 of them tonight. They, they get bored. Even the best of them. And here's one of the best of them. Here, so here's Brian Schmidt, who is one of my graduate students, and he explained to me, he's not going to do that by looking at all the galaxies. He's going to subtract one picture from another and only see the things that are different. His eyes have actually bugged out a little bit from well, the work that he had previously done. And so here's the idea. Uh, this epic two might be tonight. Epic one might be, you know, a month ago. And uh, what you can see is that there are galaxies in there, a lot of things in there, like this nice fuzzy spiral. But it doesn't change so that when you take the difference, which you do in a computer, because this is a digital image, uh, that goes away, and the only thing that's left over is the increase in light in this image, 
And, you know, to make it all easier and a lot more fun, we put a red circle around it. Software is really good at this kind of stuff. <laughs> so uh, this, this is about one one thousandth of the area of the image of the big detectors. So uh, you're searching many, many galaxies uh, at once. They are very faint galaxies. They come, the light comes from long ago. This is what allows you to search the distant past. The other thing is that um, I haven't told you the whole story. We're judging the brightness of the, the distance of objects by their brightness. Now, many of you may be familiar with coastwise navigation, where the navigation books always tell you, do not judge your distance from a light by its brightness. Because there could be fog, or there could be refraction, or this or that. Yeah, sure. Well, it turns out in astronomy it's the same thing, except the penalty is much higher. In co uh, 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 no, the other way around. In coastwise navigation, the penalty for failing to obey this is shipwreck or death. In astronomy, it's writing an erratum or something like that. Anyway, the idea is that a supernova going off behind a cloud of dust will look fainter, and so you might mistakenly think it's far away. So you have to have some way to correct for that, which we do by the fact that the dust not, doesn't absorb all the colors equally. It absorbs the blue light more than the red light. So by measuring the color, you can tell whether you're seeing it through a, a long path length of dust. It's a little like looking at the setting sun. You know how the sun gets really red as it gets near the horizon? Well, the sun doesn't change. What changes is the amount of blue light that's scattered out of the light that's coming to you because you're seeing through more of it as it gets close to the atmosphere. Yeah, it's close to the horizon. So anyway, Adam Reese, who was another of my graduate students, uh, worked on that. And here's a picture of Adam in 1966. This is me in 1966. <laughs> this is Bill Press. It turned out uh, Adam had two advisors. And uh, in Massachusetts, it's OK to have two <laughs> dads. OK. In 1997, Adam was working on the data that we had gathered on distant supernovae to see whether the expansion of the universe was uniform or not. And he was applying these methods to the samples that we assembled using the techniques that Brian had developed. And uh, Adam called me up and he said, uh, hey, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, the mass is less than zero. I said, uh, really? You must have made a mistake, I said. You know, you've forgotten to divide by the square root of pi or I don't know what. Now here is his notebook. Adam went to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology a fine institution where they teach you to write stuff down in your lab notebook. And here it is. From, and it, he found this negative mass. And I said, well, OK, why don't you and Brian you know, scrub this out and see if you've made a mistake? Because you know, if not, it means that there's a cosmological constant. And if that's true, you're going to be violating Einstein's solemn curse, and you're wallowing in poison ivy. Do not do that. He said, all right, we'll just look at the data. OK. So it turns out that if you look at the data uh, for supernovae at large distances, that it tells you that the universe was expanding slower back then. This is the kind of plot, this is a highly professional plot, but in many colors, that shows you uh, that this line fits the data for supernovae over a wide range of distance, and that line includes slowing down in the past. And uh, here's a kind of complicated looking plot. It tells you how much gravitating stuff there is slowing things down, and how much other stuff there is speeding the universe up, something like the cosmological constant. And what you can see is that this is the data from 1998, that these ellipses are kind of like big zeppelins, but you know they kind of pick out this part of the diagram. Here's zero dark energy, zero cosmological constant, that they favored an ex a universe that was accelerating. What I showed you a minute ago was the plot that has uh, all the near uh, recent data. And if you put it on the same plot, you can see how much smaller the ellipse is. That means we've done our homework. We've measured a lot more supernovae. We've measured them better. We know now 
15 years later, that um, this uh, is really exclude the supernovae, that blue ellipse really excludes um, a universe that isn't slowing, that isn't speeding up. So it, it really is speeding up. Here's another way to show you this. Here's the data and those, that line that's moving are for different amounts of dark energy in the universe, the cosmological constant-like stuff, the stuff that's speeding up. And when it's zero, that's zero, that doesn't fit the data. And then as it ticks through, you can see, oh, it fits pretty well now, and that's a little too much. It really works. So it's really easy now, but was not easy in 1998 because the data were so crummy. Galileo wrote, all truths are easy to understand once they are discovered. The point is to discover them. And it's much harder when you're on the cusp of something and you don't know whether it's real or it's not real or you've made an error or you haven't. It's much harder than it is now to see what's going on. So now everybody knows we live in an accelerating universe. Here's Einstein. He's a little surprised. Although, if you notice, under his arm, he's now carrying a sheaf that begins with the cosmological constant, lambda. Little revisionist there, diving into your own dumpster, Mr. Einstein. We really live in an accelerating universe. <laughs> and the proof of it is that the state of Maine issued me this license plate. I was passed by the guy who has the license plate that says accelerating from New Hampshire. He was just driving a Jaguar really fast. <laughs> I don't think it was a cosmological statement. The um, Swedish Academy, very conservative people, those Swedes. Uh, but now uh, they're convinced, and here's Adam, no, Brian, uh, shaking the hand of uh, Gustav. Isn't that his name? Anyway, so the king. Uh, Saul Perlmutter from another team. Uh, Brian and Adam received the Nobel Prize in 2011, and here's the occasion, taken by Jane from our view up in the balcony. <laughs> okay. Uh, for the discovery of the accelerating expansion of the universe through the observations of distant supernovae. It's good to be there. And in fact, here I am, basking in the reflected glory in the uh, Grand Hotel in uh, Stockholm. And the guys are wearing their little gold things that Gustav gave them, uh, but I have these badges for them. Because <laughs> they are my students. Okay. And here are uh, a bunch of us, and these are the people who were on my, uh, in my research group at one time or another. Quite a few. Okay. Oh, not him. Well, anyway. Okay. <laughs> so what does this show? Okay. This shows uh, that we do live in an accelerating universe, that the supernovae show it, and that we think something like the cosmological constant is responsible. Now, when you put the supernova data together with information about how the galaxies are clustered and the glow from the Big Bang itself, you get this picture of, of which my theoretical colleagues are very proud. They say, oh, look at this picture. The diagram is full. You should ask, what is it full of? And in this case, it's full of our most important uh, resource, which is ignorance. The dark energy is supposed to be 73% of the universe, the stuff that's making the cosmic acceleration. We've only discovered that 15 years ago, and we don't know what it is. We don't know whether it's the cosmological constant. The gravitating stuff, it turns out, is uh, a combination of stuff we call do cold dark matter that Zwicky hinted at, plus the atoms of the periodic table that we know about. And we're only about 4% of the universe. I don't know how this makes you feel. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Rogers would be helpful. I feel pretty good about it myself. I feel special. I feel like I'm made of a small fraction of what the universe is. But it does show that there's a lot of potential. I like to show this figure to the dean. And I say, you know, this is chemistry and this is astronomy and physics. What do you think? <laughs> he says, I don't know. <laughs> Go away. Okay. All right. 
So um, this dark matter is real. It is associated with the galaxies, but there's much more matter associated with galaxies than is in the stars that are glowing. And Zwicky knew that. And you can see it in this picture. There's the presence of matter curves space, and it changes the path of light. You can see there are arcs here, these subtle kind of uh, spherical arcs that are around this cluster of galaxies because the light from objects behind it is bent. The same way light, if you take a wine glass, for example, and you put it up to your eye and look out in the parking lot, you'll see rings of light. And the rings of light are caused by the refraction, by the bending of light. And there's a bending of light that gravity induces uh, in these clusters. That's real. And it's much more than the bending that you would get just from the stars that we know. Uh, so the galaxies that we see are really embedded in a halo of this dark matter. Our galaxy is probably embedded in such a thing, and people are looking for it. There are detectors, solid state detectors again, looking for the recoil of these dark matter particles. There ought to be a mist of them in this room and down in some mine that the detectors are going through. And people are looking to see whether they can detect that. OK. Yes, the diagram's full. Of course, you know, our part of the universe is the tastiest part. That if you look at that pie diagram and you think of it, all pies are actually made of baryons, the neutrons and protons, the stuff of the periodic table, the stuff of chemistry, the stuff of cooking. In a more comic mode, I might actually eat a pie in this moment. But anyway, uh, so how do we think about this? How do we think about this? Well, I have. Uh, Describe my work as an observational astronomer, but I got to tell you, I have a card from the International Brotherhood of Theorists, valid to infinity, uh, which allows me to pontificate on this subject briefly. So I will. Uh, if you, in the old days, if you Googled dark energy, you know that's what people do to find out what's going on. Uh, you would get this, which is from American Hydroponics. It's a group of uh, plant cultivators in uh, Berkeley, California. They describe the properties of dark energy. They say, the dark energy is a very good plant food for growing controlled substances in your closet. Uh, and it says, it has specialized processes which are responsible for the very distinct odor of dark energy. So we don't know what it is. Could be the cosmological concept, but we know it smells bad. Uh, if you Punch a theoretical physicist and you say, come on, estimate for me the energy density associated with gravity in the vacuum, that thing that the priest, uh, uh, Lemaitre, was talking about uh, back in 1931. Well, they can do that. They say, well, we know what the uh, length scale is or the mass scale that's associated with gravity. And so they can estimate what the energy density of the vacuum ought to be. And it turns out, in some units, it's 10 to the 120th. That means a 1 with 120 zeros, bigger than a Google. Uh, and the actual answer is 0.7. Okay, if you hand this in for a homework answer, you know, some, where the real answer is 0.7, and you write down 10 to the 120th, that's what, in academic circles, we call not good quantitative agreement what ordinary people call wrong. This is wrong. There's something missing. And so it's, something's missing in our understanding of gravity at the microscopic level. And that, this result is, is pointing to that. Now, uh, so how do you feel about that? Well, here's Jane again, my wife, and she's wearing a t-shirt. And uh, it has some kind of smart Alex saying on it. Uh, which I saw in a gift shop at a scientific institution in another country. And it says, although the universe is under no obligation to make sense, students pursuing the PhD are. <laughs> I thought that was really funny. And then I realized I had said that. <laughs> and I said to the people selling the t-shirt, I said, I'm Robert P. Kirshner. I said that. And they said, you're going to get a good discount. <laughs> which I did. So uh, maybe the way to think about this is to go back to Einstein's equations and to think of a term associated with the vacuum, which is like 
uh, the cosmological constant, which is the cosmological constant. So I did that. Here I am at that statue in Washington, and I was going to start carving this in <laughs> when the park police came by and said that they were theoretical physicists and they didn't want to put it on the right hand side. Okay. So how do you think about this? There are two things in the universe. There's gravity that's slowing things down. There's this dark energy, or maybe it's the cosmological constant speeding things up. It's like a tug of war. But over time, this is a tug of war between the boys and the girls. The girls get bigger. And the girls start to win the tug of war. And so at first, maybe the guys are winning. But eventually, the tide changes. This is in elementary school. And, uh, that's happened in the universe, that the matter has gotten more dilute as the universe has expanded. The gravitation has gotten less compared to the dark energy, which has stayed constant and has now got the upper hand and is now making the universe accelerate. That's what we think. So when you look at a galaxy, you're not seeing what's really going on. You're seeing a tracer of what's going on. 4% of the universe is in the luminous stuff. The rest is invisible, but more important in determining the long-term uh, outcome of the expansion of the universe. Perhaps a metaphor will help. Here, you do not see the mountain, grasshopper. You see the snow. The snow is not the mountain. What you see is the snow. But the mass is in the mountain. And in the same way, what you see in a galaxy is the luminous stuff, the stars, but what's really gravitating is the dark matter, this unseen stuff. Well, that was such a success, I think I'll go on to the dark. <laughs> what about the dark energy? Well, you know, when you look outside and you see the trees moving, and somebody says, well, it's making the trees move. You say, well, it's the wind. You don't see the wind, you see the effects of the wind. You see the tree moving. So like the astronomical observations, we see the distances changing with time and so on. We don't see the dark energy, but we see the effect of it. OK. I cannot recommend a better book, if you want to know more about this, than the one that I wrote that's about this chase for the dark energy. What about the future? OK. You're probably thinking, yes, yes, the future. Let's use this dark energy to make flying cars. No, we don't know how to do that. We hardly understand what it is at all. But we are looking to the distant universe to try to understand how things have changed over time. And we're using improved technology to do it. One of the things we're trying to do at our place is to build a new telescope, much more powerful than the one that Hubble had, this giant Magellan telescope, which will allow us to see the distant universe and to pick out the supernovae and measure how the universe has been changing over time. This is just to illustrate that here's a galaxy and here's a supernova taken with the Hubble Space Telescope. Here's before and after. Here's what the image would look like from the ground. This image of a star would be as big as that from the ground, so it would be really hard to do it because of the blurring of the atmosphere. With the Space Telescope, it's about that big. With the telescope we hope to build, we'll overcome the problems in the atmosphere and make a dot as small as that, which will make it much, much easier to make accurate measurements of distant supernovae and really try to understand this dark energy. OK, what about the long-term future? A lot of people are involved in the financial world, might be interested in this. Here's the present. What will happen in the future? Well. It depends on the nature of the dark energy. If it is exactly the cosmological constant, the universe will expand exactly exponentially, just like compound interest, that the fraction of the universe that changes will be proportional to the size. As the size get bigger, gets bigger, the expansion will go faster. It's possible that it'll go even faster than that, leading to consequences so dreadful I don't even want to talk about them after dinner. <laughs> We don't yet know enough about the dark energy to know whether we have ruled out the possibility that the universe will collapse in the distant future. We don't know. But in the medium term, we have some ideas of what, what's going to happen uh, in our own neighborhood. Uh, I talked about the Andromeda galaxy. Hubble measured the distance to it. It turns out it's coming toward us. 
And someday when you go outside on Nantucket on a dark night, it's going to look more like this. There's going to be a collision. Check your homeowner's insurance. <laughs> and in four billion years from now, four billion years from 1917, the Milky Way will once again be our universe because the exponential expansion will take the other galaxies away and it'll just be us and Andromeda. Milk Andromeda and G-Way. I don't know. Anyway, whatever that will be called. Uh, left over and astronomers will not be able to measure the, the properties of the expanding universe. Okay. So that's enough. Uh, let me uh, say a little bit about this kind of science. Um, when I was the president of the American Astronomical Society, I would stand shoulder to shoulder with presidents of other learned societies, and we would talk to congressmen and other people, and we'd tell them why they should support science. And we'd say stuff like this, mostly the chemists. But anyway, we'd say stuff like this. Uh, well, uh, it's very important to support science because that's the basis for technology and uh, for defense and for medicine. Congressmen are interested in all that stuff. A lot of them are old guys. They like that. Uh, and we wanted to make this so that they would be rich. People like that. Safe and immortal. Well, OK, long lived. But I don't think that's why we're doing this kind of science. We are not promising you that we're going to do any of those things, although, in fact, we do push on technology, and some of these things have other good effects. We're doing this because we want to know. We, we want to know things. And it would not be nirvana if we were bored out of our minds in this way. Uh, we want to understand how the world works. And this is science that we do for the joy of finding out how the world works. Thank you very much for your attention. Yes, I'm sure I've answered all the questions, but just in case something was not clear or you had had a thought either before or during or after the talk. Go ahead. Do you, uh, would you, do you have a microphone for him? I can repeat the question. Go ahead. Um, so given all that, what are some of the um, research questions and hypotheses that this next generation is on the edge of? Right. So the question is, What's next? And so I would say the nature of the dark energy is something that is, is really a pressing research question. We don't know what it is. Is it the cosmological constant or not? For example, I didn't really explain it, but it could be that there's some additional component to the universe that changes over time that is not constant. That's not Einstein's factor, but some other light scalar field, it turns out. And uh, uh, that's a perfectly legitimate idea. And we should try to find out whether that's true or false. So what I'm doing is using supernovae that I'm measuring in the infrared at longer wavelengths where the dust doesn't matter, because I don't think Adam did his job right. And uh, as a result, we can uh, measure the distances more precisely and have a more certain knowledge of what the relation between distance and velocity is. And by doing that, we can see how the transition from slowing down to speeding up took place and find out if that's consistent with the cosmological constant or not. So I think that's the next thing. I can see how to do it. Well, I can see how to do some of it. And uh, there are many other ideas that other people have about how to proceed. So. I think that's something that we will do. So I think a fair question for the research agenda for the next decade or two will be, what is the nature of the dark energy? Is it the cosmological constant or not? Yeah? Uh, there have been some articles uh, uh, giving alternate explanations for the expansion. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
How much does the data show that it's isotropic? Yeah, it's a great question. So the question is whether the expansion is the same in all directions or not. And uh, that's uh, another thing <laughs> we're working on. So uh, what we've done is we looked at 12 fields around the sky, not one in each zodiac constellation, but, you know, more or less. Uh, and uh, we'll measure the effect that we've done summed up in each of those fields and see whether there is any difference uh, between them. If you found some systematic difference that showed the expansion was faster along some axis, that would really be interesting. It would be contrary to what most people believe, but, you know, this whole thing is contrary to what most people believed in 1990. And well, you have to, they have to prove. yeah, you have to, I think that's right, that there are many things that people assume because it's simpler, oh, it must be the same in all directions, must be homogeneous and so on, for which there is no proof or in some cases not much of a test. And so uh, measuring whether the expansion is the same in all directions and whether the acceleration is the same in all directions is a good project and we're going to do it. So thank you. thank you. I hope you're in the National Science Foundation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah in the back. Yeah, right, right, fair enough. So I, 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 sure, yeah, good, good, good. Okay, well, I didn't mean to be uh, uh, derisive about the uh, uh, other benefits of science. You know, these other things really are truly benefits of science. But this kind of science, I think, appeals mostly to your imagination and to your notion of where we are in the world. And I think it does matter. The question of whether humanity is at the center of things or not, uh, you know, I kind of think it's settled, but most people, you know, need a little more persuading. And uh, the idea that we live in a universe that is uh, more or less indifferent to us, but which we have been able to understand by learning science and by applying our, our technology, I think is a tremendously inspiring story. I think it's a very good story, and I think it's something that gives us hope that we'll be able to solve other uh, problems of, that have a big technological or scientific component in them in the future. You don't know whether this dark energy will turn out to be something that is completely a discussion among the experts, or whether it will have some a uh, ramification that helps us understand how the world works in some way that we can apply. I don't promise that, we, that it, it will, but it might, in the same way that electricity and magnetism were kind of laboratory curiosities for a while, and then they became the basis for electric motors and, you know, all the um, electronic things that we have. The curious thing here is that this is very far from laboratory uh, experiment. And so that, that's what makes it kind of peculiar and different. It's only observed in the astronomical realm. But you know, that was true about the speed of light. In that picture with Einstein and all those guys in front of the blackboard, there was uh, Albert Michelson, who measured the speed of light uh, with good precision at the turn of the century. And uh, it turns out that astronomers knew in the 1600s that the speed of light was finite. That, you know, a foot and a nanosecond, well, we didn't, well, anyway. We knew that it was not infinitely fast. Uh, and it took until uh, the 1800s before there was a laboratory experiment that could measure these short intervals of time. After all, on an ordinary laboratory scale, it was only tens of nanoseconds that were the you know, the, and, and pendulum clocks didn't do that very well, uh, that were the intervals that you could measure between the light bouncing between mirrors. So there's no laboratory experiment yet be, that can tell us much about the dark energy, but that doesn't mean there, there never will be. So your question was a, a, a good one. It's, you know, what does this mean to us? I think it has to do with our picture of where we came from, where we are, and where we're going, and a lot of people care about that. 
but in terms of a, a practical application, I wouldn't promise anything right away. But it happens that our conceptual development, you know, understanding things better, does lead to these, uh, does lead to practical developments. Einstein's uh, photoelectric, you know, equation, kind of a curiosity about metals back in uh, the 1900, or at 1900, but you know, now it's related to the basis of, a, you know, your, your iPhone camera. So uh, there's all that stuff that comes from the broader understanding. So my hope is that that is going to be the, that's going to be the benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Not having a real understanding of gravity affects what you're talking about? Well, there are, we do have a pretty good understanding of gravity in terms of Einstein's theory. Einstein's theory tells you how the presence of matter and energy curves space and how objects move in that curved space. So that's pretty good. The part that's not so good and that you're alluding to is that our other knowledge of the other forces in the world is very different our knowledge of electromagnetism. So why don't your hands go through each other? Well, it's because there's an electrostatic force between the electrons in one hand and the other. Uh, the nuclear force that generates energy in a nuclear reactor or that, uh, that's involved in radioactivity, those strong and weak uh, nuclear forces, those are things which, all of which are understood as quantum theories. And so we have this idea that the very microscopic world, kind of different from the big world, and that we have a whole way of understanding how the forces work at small scales. And all of those forces are unified in one framework of uh, uh, theoretical physics, except for gravity. So there's, gra there's the forces of nature, all the ones that you know from life except for gravity, are, and even ones you don't, you know, the weak force, you're not too familiar with that. Uh, uh, all of that stuff is one kind of theory, and uh, gravity is another. In his later years, when he was at the Institute for Advanced Study, uh, Einstein worked on somehow trying to get these unified, to get this all to be aspects of one thing, in which he did not make much success. But people are talking about that now. And string theory, it turns out, is a way of talking about the world that's a new kind of quantum world that uh, includes, or can include, or might include, gravity under the same framework as the other forces. So while nobody knows that that is the correct way to understand how nature works on the small scale, there's an attempt to include gravity with the other forces. So I think that's the area where people are working, and that's where there's some hope that there'll be a picture. It may not be a picture that's easily accessible to most people, but that at least for theoretical physics puts gravity on the same footing uh, as the other forces in the world. And that would be a very good uh, step forward to the thing that you're looking for, which is kind of a real understanding of where gravity comes from. So you're right. We don't really know, but uh, we have a perfect good theory for computing how it works. That's general relativity, which has shown itself to have tremendous predictive power and agrees with the observations extremely well. But on the conceptual level, you know, we'd like to connect it with the other things. So we'll see how that goes. I'm not going to contribute to that, except as kind of a cheerleader. Yeah. Right, right. And that one thing that can get into the way of the brightness is dust. Right. Aren't there different like, sort of wattages of stars? And how can you tell, how can you get right. the bright constant? Right, right. So the question is, how do you know those stars are all the same when you're trying to measure their distance from the brightness? And the answer is, 
you have to establish that empirically. So you have to look nearby at objects that are, you know are at the same distance. That's what Henrietta Leavitt did. Or you say, well, now we know that nearby Hubble's law is a good law, so we'll look at things that, you know, nearby whose velocity we can measure, and that will tell us how bright those guys are, and we'll calibrate that from the Cepheids or something like that. But you have to identify the objects. And what I left out was the whole kind of botany of uh, knowing supernovae. This, it turns out, I am a great expert on. <laughs> you know, I spent a long time studying all the different kinds of supernovae, and we know from the spectrum of each one which kind it is, and for the ones of a particular kind, we've developed relations between the way the light gets bright and dim and how bright they really are that are much more complicated, well, more complicated than what I talked about tonight. So you're going to have to trust me a little on this. But what I'm telling you is that you've put your finger on exactly the most important problem, which is, are the supernovae near and far the same intrinsically, and how do you know that? And uh, I didn't talk about that tonight, so you're, that's a completely fair question. All I'm saying is, I'm now <clears throat> I will assert my authority and say, we know this, <laughs> and we're working on it really hard. Uh, but um, uh, uh, that is, uh, that's a really hard problem because our knowledge of the nearby ones is so much more detailed than it is of the distant ones that um, uh, they seem to agree, but maybe there are small details that are different in some way we don't yet uh, understand. Having bigger telescopes and better information on the faint objects would help us a lot. Yeah. Uh, I, think, I think we have time for two questions. Go ahead. It depends on the length of the answers. How is space relative to the expansion of the universe? Is there a fixed space that our universe Ah, good is? question. And then if there isn't, what about our polar opposite with the antimatter? What if they need each other? What will that do? Will that cause the universe to almost shrink in reverse to expand it? OK, let me answer the first part, which I understood. <laughs> first part was, should we think about this as a fixed space in which there are objects moving, right? Are there objects expanding through a fixed space? And the answer is no. You should think about it as the space expanding, a little like that animation that I showed where I stretched, all I did was stretch things by 10% from one frame to the next, but in all directions and equally. And that looks to you as an observer inside that coordinate system as if, the nearby things are moving away and the distant things are moving away more rapidly. So the way we think about it is that first way, that the space is stretching out, not the objects moving through space. So that's a very important conceptual question. Your second question had to do with antimatter. Turns out we don't know for sure, but we think really very likely that the antimatter gravitates in the same way that matter does. So People are going to do the experiment. They're going to make enough antiparticles, which turn out to be quite hard to make on the Earth and hard to keep because every time they touch another particle, they make gamma rays. The, but you can do it, and uh, uh, people are going to look to see whether the antimatter particles fall down or up, okay? which is kind of what you're asking. And uh, everybody thinks they're going to fall down. But, you know, Maybe you should look. And so people are uh, doing those experiments. So you're, you're right on the, um, that's on the frontier. We don't know for sure how antimatter behaves. We believe that there's very little of it and that it, in any case it will behave just like the matter. But we're going to find out by doing laboratory experiments. So, uh, so that's in the near future. I'm sure you'll read a headline, antimatter falls down. <laughs> just like we thought. But maybe not. You know, you have to keep an open mind on these things. You have to actually do the measurement and really find out. Okay, All right. Forward. That was such a long answer. One more. Okay. I'll be brief. Your, your pick. Okay. In the back there. Sorry. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, you mentioned that your students found um, something that had negative mass. Yeah. And maybe I didn't get yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, I thought he was, Mr. Minute. Well, no, what it meant was he assumed that the cosmological constant was zero. And then he did the analysis and he found it, the universe was acting as if it had negative mass. That meant it was accelerating. And what that really meant was that the cosmological constant was not zero, or the dark energy was not zero, and the correct interpretation was not negative mass, but acceleration. And so, uh, well, we caught on to that pretty fast, you know. <laughs> that didn't take very long. But uh, it was a funny moment because the data, I didn't really show you the original data. They're pretty crummy, you know. And uh, we were just seeing a strong hint of it. And the question is, you know, at what point do you publish a strong hint? Because it's so important. And if you're right, you might end up in Stockholm. But, or wait until you, you know, wait another year, get another set of data. You know, we had to decide uh, uh, what to do. And uh, so we had a lively discussion on that subject, which is discussed in my book, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, you know, some real quotes from the emails. And uh, it, was, it was a very interesting thing, because, you know, in my opinion, the punishment for being wrong should be bigger than the reward for being right. But it turns out it's not true. <laughs> true. Uh, you promised me to We, we promised an enthralling evening, and I think uh, we delivered. Bob, that was spectacular. And he'll be available to sign some books uh, if you'd like to do that. Thank you, everyone.